Hello, everyone. I'm Comron. And I'm Billy. Welcome to the Horse Rock Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors. Today, we'll be discussing Book 4, Chapter 20 of Dead House Gates, a novel in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. This is Part 2 of our coverage of this chapter. This podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review. It's most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Just know that Comrade and I know this series to be the best fantasy story ever written. And this is a pure fanboy point of view kind of thing going on here. There'll be no critique. Just we're going to marvel at these books, and especially as we approach the end of this book, because we're really close. And let's face it, folks, this is a great book, man. <laughs> it's just amazing. It's better than Gardens. <laughs> yeah. It's really, really good. It's my favorite. The weepy chapter, misty-eyed chapter. This is a difficult chapter for me, yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> we'll be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those that haven't read the books. We'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book. A quick warning, today's episode contains descriptions of extreme violence, and it's not recommended for children. Our show is listener-supported. If you'd like to support us, we'd really appreciate it. You can do so by visiting our Patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Currently, we're posting ad-free episodes on Patreon weekly. Also, we'd really like to hear from you, and I do really mean that. So send any feedback or comments that you have to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. All right. Chapter 20, Part 2. We pick up the chapter with the chain of dogs. A Wiccan horse warrior struck the ground and rolled, coming to a stop at Duiker's feet. No more than a lad, he looked almost peaceful, eyes closed as if in gentle sleep. But for him, all dreams had ended. Duiker stepped over the body and stood for a moment in the dust it had raised. The short sword in his right hand was glued there by blood. Riders wheeled across the hoof-churned space before Duiker. Arrows sped out from the gaps between them. He jerked his shield around to catch one darting for his face, and grunted as the rim was driven against his mouth and chin, splitting both. That's a heck of a lot of force behind that arrow. Yeah, could it be a bolt, maybe? A crossbow bolt? Possibly. But that's a heck of good reaction from Duiker. Yeah, this chapter really makes him out to be quite the soldier, doesn't it? (laughs) rock star, dude. I mean, he's like, he's elite. Let's just face it. We should have known this before. He survived this long. You don't do that by being just behind the scenes. He's elite. (laughs) Yeah, it's interesting because he's one of the few characters we get the inner monologue for. And he's so, I don't want to say scared, but I would say he underestimates his own skill level. He downplays his own contribution for sure. Yeah. Because I think he feels that if he's doing anything, he's going to be overshadowing anything. So he won't say anything about himself hardly at all. A lot of people, they'll judge themselves harsher than other people do yeah some people are their own worst critics so maybe it's partially that as well tarxian cavalry had broken through and was only moments away from severing the dozen remaining squads from the rest of the company the crow counterattack had been savage and furious but costly worst of all it might well have failed the infantry squads had been broken apart and had reformed into four groups only one of them substantial which now struggled to re-knit less than a score of crow horse warriors remained upright each one surrounded by Tarxians hacking at them. Everywhere, horses writhed and screamed on the ground. The back end of a cavalry horse nearly knocked Duiker over. Stepping around, Duiker closed in and thrust the point of his sword into the Tarxian's leather-clad thigh. The light armor resisted a moment until Duiker threw all his weight behind the stab. Feeling the point pierce flesh, sink deep and grate against bone, he twisted the blade. I have to say, this is one thing that Erickson always does it just hurts and you hear him say it quite often in his battle scene grating against the bone i'm like oh (laughs) yeah it's terrible every time you hear it oh i know it (laughs) the one that comes to mind that really gets me is kalam chipping the tip of his knife because he stabbed and got caught in some bone inside of somebody yes yes (laughs) Yes. it's it's like golly that's nasty that's just uh, that's terrible yeah, that's really, for some reason, that makes it more visceral. That makes it more sink home to like, oh, that's real. That's not like, you know, for some reason that sells it. I don't know what it is, but not Mr. Erickson, but, that, but the grating against the bone always sells it to me. I'm like, okay, enough. <laughs> I'm <Man>. sold. <laughs> this reminds me of a little situation I got myself into. We were camping Uh-oh. when I was a kid and I had a hatchet. Uh-oh. And I don't know what I was thinking, but I was hacking at some log or something. I had my leg in a bad position and the hatchet (laughs) 
hit the log, but then it continued and buried itself in my shin. Oh, the tip of the hatchet. <laughs> oh, it hit the bone. the bone. It grated against the bone, literally. Oh, no. Oh. It left a, it was a pretty small incision in my oh. shin, but you could see the bone through it. It was oh. <laughs> terrible. Oh, oh my yeah. gracious, dude. It wasn't bad enough for me to get stitches or anything. I think we put a butterfly bandage on it and I was all right. But I've experienced this. <laughs> <laughs> on the receiving end. Oh, no. I'm so sorry. Actually, short. technically, <laughs> technically, I was on the giving and the receiving and the end. Receiving. Oh, my. <laughs> True masochist. It's like it's like all right, man. Yeah. A sadist, you're the you're a sadist and a masochist. Oh, man. It's like all right, uh, dude. Yeah. Okay. Being a knucklehead that. is what I was they, they, doing, oh, dude. I, you know, this this goes to our point. It's like I I've I've almost I've hurt myself really bad as a child with things, and we've talked about this. I said something to my father the other day, and he laughed so hard. But the fact is, yeah, our toys aren't taking out enough of them anymore. That's that's what the problem is. That's the problem with the society. You know, it's like some of our toys used to take out the weak. You know, oh, like, yeah, I've, I've barely survived. I'm like, okay, I'm good. It's like you know, you know what I'm saying. You look at some of those toys from the '50s. How Ooh. dangerous they were. Did I tell you about my cannon? <laughs> no. <laughs> have i not mentioned my cannon okay. no okay this is an i would have been so this is 19 probably 78 to 80 okay i would have been anywhere from 9 to 10 or 11 i have a summer birthday two or three weeks before the fourth of july and my dad always likes buying fireworks and loves blowing stuff up we're texas people what do you want um <laughs> and we're men i'm sorry <laughs> let's just cut to the chase i'm a dude i like to blow <laughs> things up so <laughs> He gets me this, it's a cannon. I'm kidding you not. It's a metal cannon. It's only about uh, 10 to 12 inches long. It's got a striker on top that is an actual, like a flint. Mm -hmm. And what you did is you put, it took water and carbide, which is, you know what carbide is? For mining lamps, the old school mining lamps that the old dudes used to use digging coal would use carbide lights. It's a type of mineral or something that burns mm. real bright. So you put it in water and it makes a gas, very sulfurous smelling gas. And so you pull out the striker and you pop that thing and it ignites it, dude. It's, like, oh, my <laughs> it's God. a boom. It's a boom with some flame. It's, it's, you know, and dude, you know, are you talking about the, we lived in the country. So it's like, I mean, it was like, boom, boom. <laughs> you know, was, oh. the only thing that made us not have it, you, you couldn't find that stuff to put in it very often. So, but oh my word. Yeah. I feel that, you know, yeah, it's up to the nineties. I think everything was okay. I think our generation, my generation in particular is the ones that I, I'm sorry, folks. If it, <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. I don't have children, but it is my generation. And I am truly sorry. <laughs> so did you ever put any projectiles in this thing to no, see what would happen? It was just not, I, a noisemaker. It was just a noisemaker. See, we lived in the country, so I mean, I had really nice BB guns, pellet guns, and stuff like that. So it might would have if you, if because if the tube was actually pretty big, I mm -hmm. think it was big on purpose, so you really couldn't try to do that. You just weren't trying hard enough. Well, you're, you're correct, <laughs> sir. I did not try hard enough. So, um, uh, but yeah, that's. I, I think about that, and I think about nowadays. I'm like, yeah, that wouldn't go at all. You know, people would be freaking out over that. It's like, man, yeah, come on, man. Come on. I mean, that's crazy. I, mean, dude, I think it's, I'm going to be like Timmy here. It's like, I mean, come on. <laughs> come on. I mean, <laughs> come on. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Moving along. Okay. Thanks for that story. You're welcome. A Tolwar slashed down, biting solidly into Duiker's shield. He bent low, pulling the snagged weapon with him. Fresh blood drenched his sword hand as he yanked his blade free. Duker hacked and chopped at the man's hip until the horse sidestepped, carrying the rider beyond his reach. He pushed his helm rim clear of his eyes, blinked away grit and sweat, then moved forward again, toward the largest knot of infantry. And kind of going back to our point earlier about him being elite, he's doing yeah. really well. His reaction times and the yeah. decisions that he's making, he, he's doing pretty good for an quote-unquote old man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, better than I'd be doing. I've been dead like the first week. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm aware of myself. I'm a self-aware man. Trust me. Yeah, I may make it a, maybe have made it a week. Probably not that long. You might surprise yourself. You might be like List. I could be. 
Yeah. I, yeah, I, that's possible. I, I mean, but yeah, this is a pretty tough, this is a pretty tough group he hangs, he's hanging with here. <laughs> mm-hmm. Three days since Sanamon Valley and the bloody reprieve granted them by the Kundril tribe. Their unexpected allies had closed that battle, pursuing the remnants of their rival tribes into the hours of dusk, before slipping off to return presumably to their own lands. They had not been seen since. And that's pretty crazy that they came in and attacked, then left. Do you think their motive was based around seeing an opportunity to take some of the rival tribes down a peg or two? I think they came in with the intention of doing what they were supposed to do, which was attack them from Corbolo, you're working for the whirlwind or, or not the whirlwind, but the Corbolo Doms group. Mm-hmm. I think that because they were another horse clan, that's how I take it, that they just gained such mutual respect of the Wiccans that they just turned in honor of the Wiccans and were like, these guys shame us. It's like they all of a sudden awakened and were like, dude, forget this. Let's go back to doing what we're doing, which is we know what we're doing. And they probably, and yes, and they took that opportunity to chase those other fellows out in respect. But it's twofold. I mean, yes, taking advantage of a situation, but I think it was done because it, I don't think it was initially entered into originally like that. It was like mm-hmm. they, when they all of a sudden switched sides because of the Wiccans, it was like, forget these guys. We're going to chase these guys. We'll take care of these fellows for you. <laughs> okay. The mauling had driven Corbolodom into a rage. That much was patently clear, for the attacks were now incessant, a running battle over 40 hours long, and with no sign that it would relent anytime soon. 40 hours straight. Imagine the exhaustion. Yeah, I can't. I mean, it's one thing to just stay up 40 hours, <laughs> but to be in a running battle for 40 hours, I cannot imagine. Yeah that at all but yeah this is good gracious this is what makes this so tough the beleaguered chain of dogs was struck again and again from the flanks from behind at times from two or three directions at once what vengeful blades lances and arrows did not achieve exhaustion was completing soldiers were simply falling to the ground their armor in tatters countless minor wounds slowly draining the last of their reserves hearts failed Major blood vessels burst beneath skin to blossom into bruises that were deep black, as if some dreadful plague now ran amok through the troops. The scenes Duerker had witnessed were beyond horror, beyond his ability to comprehend. He reached the infantry even as the other groups managed to close and link up, wheeling into a bladed wheel formation that no horse, no matter how well trained, would challenge. Within the ring, a swordsman began beating sword on shield, bellowing to add his voice to the rhythm of blows. The wheel spun each soldier stepping in time, spun, crossing the ground, spun, slowly returning to where the remaining company still held the line on this, the west flank of the chain. Duerker moved with them, a part of the outer ring, delivering killing blows to whatever wounded enemy soldier the wheel trampled. Five crow riders kept pace. They were the last survivors of the counterattack, and of those, two would not fight again. A few moments later, the wheel reached the line, broke apart, and melted into it. The Wiccans dug spurs into their lathered horses to race southward. Duerker pushed his way through the ranks until he stumbled into the clear. He lowered his quivering arms, spat blood onto the ground, then slowly raised his head. That bladed wheel formation would be another thing I'd like to see on the screen. Yes. Oh, yes. (laughs) I'm thinking like Ridley. I need to see Ridley Scott in one of those like, one of those great ones, like from Gladiator kind of style, but you know, one of those kind of shots with, you you can see it, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Oh yeah. That'd be amazing. I appreciate this because it displays the training the Malazan soldiers get that you really don't see happening with the seven cities armies. Yes. And these guys are exhausted. Yeah. And they're still putting it up. It's a golly respect, mad respect. Yeah. They get strength from each other. Yeah, that's true. They really do. The mass of refugees marched before him, a procession grinding past the spot where Duerker stood. Wreathed in dust, hundreds of faces were turned in his direction, watching that thin cordon of infantry behind him, all that lay between them and slaughter, as it surged, buckled, and grew ever thinner with each minute that passed. The faces were expressionless, driven to a place beyond thought and beyond emotion. They were part of a tidal flow where no ebb was possible, where to drop back too far was fatal, and so they stumbled on, clutching the last and most precious of their possessions, their children. 
Two figures approach Duerker, coming down alongside the stream of refugees from the vanguard position. Duerker stared at them blankly, sensing that he should recognize the two, but every face had become a stranger's face. One shouted, Historian! The voice jarred him out of his fugue. His split lips stung as he said, Captain Lull. A webbed jug was thrust at him. Duerker forced his short sword back into its scabbard and accepted the jug. The cool water filled his mouth with pain, but he ignored it, drinking deep. Lull said, We've reached Gilene Plain. The other person was Duerker's nameless marine. She wavered where she stood, and Duerker saw a vicious puncture wound in her left shoulder, where a lance point had slipped over her shield. Broken rings from her armor glittered in the gaping hole. Their eyes met. Duerker saw nothing still alive in those once beautiful, light gray eyes. Yet the alarm he felt within him came not from what he saw, but from his own lack of shock, the frightening absence of all feeling, even dismay. Lull said, Coltane wants you. Duerker said, He's still breathing, is he? Lull said, Aye. Duerker said, I imagine he wants this, and pulled free the small glass bottle on its silver chain. He said, Here. Lull frowned and interrupted, No, wants you, historian. We've run into a tribe of the Sanith Odon. So far, they're just watching. Duerker muttered, Seems the rebellion's a less certain thing down here. Sounds of battle along the flanking line diminished. Another pause. A few heartbeats in which to recover, to repair armor, quench bleeding. Lull gestured, and they began walking alongside the refugees. After a moment, Duerker asked, What tribe, then? And more importantly, what's it got to do with me? Lull said, The fist has reached a decision. Something in those words chilled Duerker. He thought to probe for more, yet dismissed the notion. The details of that decision belonged to Coltane. He thought, The man leads an army that refuses to die. We've not lost a refugee to enemy action in 30 hours. Wow. 5,000 soldiers spitting in the face of every god. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. I mean, golly. I mean, 30 hours in this, out of this 40 hours that they've not lost a single refugee. Impressive. And they have thirty to 40,000 refugees that they're guarding with yeah. 5,000 people. Goodness, that just blows me away. Lull asked, What do you know of the tribes this close to the city? Duerker said, they've no love of Aaron. Lull asked, worse for them under the Empire? Duerker grunted, seeing the direction Lull pursued in his questions. He said, no, better. The Malazan Empire understands borderlands, the different needs of those living in the countryside. Vast territories in the Empire, after all, remain nomadic, and the tribute demanded is never exorbitant. More, payment for passage across tribal lands is always generous and prompt. Coltane should know this well enough, Captain. Lull said, I imagine he does. I'm the one that needs convincing. Duerker glanced at the refugees on their left. Thoughts pushed past weariness, and Duerker felt himself tottering on an edge, beyond which he could now clearly see waited Coltane's desperate gamble. He thought the fist has reached a decision, and his officer's bulk flinched back overwhelmed with uncertainty. Has Coltane succumbed to despair, or does he see all too well? Five thousand soldiers. Duerker asked, What can I say to you, Lull? Lull said, That there's no chance left. Duerker said, You can answer that yourself. Lull grimaced and said, I dare not. It's the children, you see. It's what they have left, the last thing they have left. Duerker. Duerker's abrupt nod cut out the need to say anything more, a swiftly granted mercy. He'd seen those faces, had come close to studying them, as if he'd thought at the time, seeking to find the youth that belonged there the freedom and innocence, but that was not what he sought, nor what he found. Lull had led him to the word itself, simple, immutable, thus far still sacrosanct. He thought, five thousand soldiers will give their lives for it. But is this some kind of romantic foolishness? Do I yearn for recognition among these simple soldiers? Is any soldier truly simple, simple in the sense of having a spare, pragmatic way of seeing the world and his place in it? And does such a view preclude the profound awareness I now believe exists in these battered, footsore men and women? Duerker swung his gaze to his nameless marine and found himself meeting those remarkable eyes, as if she had but waited for him, his thoughts, doubts, and fears to come around, to seek her. She shrugged and said, Are we so blind that we cannot see it, Duerker? We defend their dignity. There, simple as that. More, it is our strength. Is this what you wish to hear? Duerker thought, I'll accept that minor castigation. 
never underestimate a soldier. And that's a good quote from her. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know what it is about that character that I like so much. I think it's because he does the absolute minimum with her. Yes. Yet it's always heavily impactful when she's there. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's, but that, that and the fact that you, you like enigmatic women. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Part of it. I think that I really like is she is obviously very proficient at her job. Mm -hmm. There's no feeling that it's forced. Yeah. She just is. You know what? She's like Manala. Yeah. Another character that I like. Yeah. I do too. <laughs> Another strong woman character that we like. like there's, no, no, there's no shame in admitting that. I would say this in front of my wife. I mean, I really would. It's like, I'm not sitting there like drooling over this imaginary woman. I'm just making a statement. Yeah, I, I'm intrigued by this woman. They're, they're both strong women. They're both impressive women. What's interesting is you don't really know much about the way they look. All we know about this Marine is that she has remarkable gray eyes. But yeah. this is a Marine yeah. that's tough as nails. Yeah. So I'm assuming she's probably not attract in the right. general sense. Yes. She's probably pretty <laughs> I'm forward beefy. thinking. There were some of the, there was a couple of the heavies later on that are some good <laughs> chicks that I'm thinking about. It's like, that are great. I love them. I can't remember their names, but my word, they're some of my favorite heavies, but they're real dense, you know? Uh -huh. I mean, mentally and physically, they're dense. <laughs> Santamon itself was a massive tell, a flat-topped hill half a mile across and over 30 arm spans high. It's jumbled plateau barren and windswept. In the Sanith Odon immediately south of it, where the chain now struggled, two ancient raised roads remained from the time when the Tell had been a thriving city. Both roads ran straight as spears on solid cut stone foundations. The one to the west, now unused as it led to another Tell in hills bone dry and nowhere else, was called... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to go for it. Yeah, go for Pain it. Sanem. Nice. The other Sanij. <laughs> oh, wow. I didn't even see that one. That's even worse. The other <laughs> Sanijem stretched southwest and still provided an overland route to the inland sea called Klatar. At a height of 15 arm spans, the roads had become causeways. So, did your inner Iranian help with that? No, not at all. <laughs> so sorry it's okay <laughs> oh my word those are usually i have no problem with his words but i'm like i gee willikers those are just like that's brand new for me from him wow. he really amped it up with these two names oh my <laughs> the second one in particular i think you're right i think santa jim is actually quite easy hey, santa jim Okay, but I think what's messing me up is it's a it's a J H E apostrophe M. Like, what right. do you do with that? <laughs> it's easier than what was that first one? I'm sorry, I have to go see the first one again. Panis San M. Yeah, Coltane's Crow Clan commanded Sanij M near the Tell, manning it as if it was a wall. The southern third of Sanamon itself was now a Wiccan strong point, with warriors and archers of the Foolish Dog and Weasel clans. As the refugees were led along the east edge of Sanamon, the Tell's high cliff wall obviated the need for a flanking guard on that side. Troops moved to support the rear guard and the eastern flank. Corbolo Dom's forces, which had been engaged in a running battle with both elements, had their noses bloodied once again. The seventh was still something to behold. Despite its diminished numbers, soldiers among it pitching dead to the ground without visible wound on them, others wailing and weeping even as they slayed their foes. The arrival of mounted Wiccan archers completed the rout, and the time had come once more for a rest. Fisk Coltane stood waiting, alone, facing the Odon to the south. His feather cloak fluttered in the wind. Lining a ridge of hills in that direction, 2,000 paces distant, another tribe sat their horses, barbaric war standards motionless against the pale blue sky. Duker's gaze held on Coltane as they approached. He tried to put himself inside his skin to find the place where the fist now lived and flinched back in his mind. He thought, no, not a failure of imagination on my part, an unwillingness. I can carry no one else's burden, not even for a moment. We are all pulled inside ourselves now, each alone. Coltane spoke without turning. The Caron Dobri, or so they are named on the map. Duker said, Aaron's reluctant neighbors. Coltane turned at that, his eyes sharp. He said, we have ever held to our treaties. Durger said, aye, Fist, we have to the outrage of many Aaron natives. 
Coltane faced the distant tribe again, silent for a long minute. Durker glanced at his nameless marine and said, You should seek a cutter. She said, I can still hold a shield. Durker said, No doubt, but it's the risk of infection. Her eyes widened and Durker was felled mute, a rush of sorrow flooding him. He broke the gaze. He thought, You're a fool, old man. Was his issue here that he voiced hope that she was going to survive and in reality she's pretty much given up the fact that she thinks she's going to die as part of this? That's kind of how I'm reading that. My impression is that no one thinks they're going to, everyone knows they're going to, not going to survive this. The soldiers do. Mm, okay. It, you know, that's my impression. And that's been my impression for the past several weeks of episodes is that the impression here is these guys, they've given up hope on themselves, but they're not quitting the job of protecting the refugees. That's what's so wild, man. I mean, it's like they know they're going to die. They're going to do it, do in their jobs because they're honorable. Yeah. We'll have a point later where we'll come back to that about them being honorable and okay. how seriously they're taking this. Coltane spoke. Captain Lull. Lull said, fist. Coltane asked, are the wagons ready? Lull said, aye, sir, coming up now. Coltane nodded and said, historian. Duerker said, fist. The Wiccan slowly turned round to face Duerker. He said, I give you Nil and Nether, a troop from the three clans. Captain, has Commander Bolt informed the wounded? Lull said, aye, sir, and they have refused you. The skin tightened around Coltane's eyes, but then he slowly nodded. Lull went on, as has Corporal List. He looked at Duerker. Coltane sighed, I admit those I selected for my own people are none too pleased, yet they will not disobey their war leader. Historian, you shall command as you see fit. Your responsibility, however, is singular. Deliver the refugees to Aaron. Duerker thought, and so we come to this. He said, fist. Coltane cut in. You are Malazan. Follow the prescribed procedures. Duerker asked, and if we are betrayed? Coltane smiled and said, then we all join Hood, here in one place. If there must be an end to this, let it be fitting. Duerker whispered, hold on as long as you can. I'll skin poor Qual's face and give the order through his lips if I have to. <laughs> Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> little Hannibal Lecter is there. That scene in Silence of the Lambs is <laughs> one of the best bait and switches that's in a movie. Oh, yes. It's so good. When he's in the cage, in, in the center of the courtroom. and those That whole scene where, spoiler alert, everybody, for Silence yeah. of the Lambs, a movie that came Crazy. out 40 years ago. <laughs> and won an Oscar. And won an Oscar. So, yeah. and so there, no, no apologies, sir. It's probably 30 years ago. It came out, probably around 92, yeah. I think. Yeah. The scene where everybody finally gets in to that holding cell at the top of the courthouse. Yes. They see what he's done. And yes. the, the way that body's silhouetted there, that's pretty wild. Mm -hmm. They find the guy on top of the elevator, blood dripping down, the suspenseful nature of that. Then when they find out that that guy's face has been skinned, we finally see that Hannibal Lecter is wearing it in the ambulance. You know, <laughs> oh, my God. It's uh, just that whole sequence is probably Amazing. my favorite part of the movie. It's yeah. beautiful. It is fantastic, dude. What's funny, I've grown to appreciate it more because at first I was not just the biggest fan of Silence of the Lambs. What was it about it you didn't like? The conclusion. The way it just fell into her lap for some reason always bothered me at first. And, dude, I'm such a huge Manhunter fan. I love Brian Cox as Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm still angry he's not Lecter. I'm sorry. I'm still bent. And I love Hopkins. Don't get me wrong. I love Anthony Hopkins. But there's something about Brian Cox was so menacing, dude. He's even more menacing than Hopkins. And, I mean, you did, we barely saw him. It's just through the later years we've seen Cox and other things. I'm like, oh, my good gracious, he would have been fantastic. I love all that stuff now. And the more I've watched it, it really truly has grown on me. Because I, once I had read the book, Silence of the Lambs, I realized the book kind of ends that way, too. It is, and a lot of times, I think the conclusion to draw from this is sometimes people find what they're looking for accidentally and stupidly. And I think cops and investigators find that a lot. I mean, stupidly, but you know, stumble into it by accident. Yeah, kind of deal. So, I agree. Um, so once I kind of came to that conclusion, I'm like, I have a much better love of the movie now because of that fact. It's like, okay, you know what? That does ring true. And once I came to that, I'm like, okay, I love it a lot more now. Like I said, I have no problem now whatsoever. I'm a huge fan. I wasn't as big a fan of, of Hannibal. Right. Coltane said, leave the high fist to the Empress and her adjunct. Dorker reached for the glass bottle around his neck. Coltane shook his head. He said, this tale is yours, historian. And right now, no one is more important than you. And if you one day see Dujek, tell him this. 
It is not the empire's soldiers the empress cannot afford to lose. It is its memory. And that is an excellent quote right there. Mm -hmm. I guess it's just part of being a human that we are bound to repeat ourselves because we lose our memory. Yeah. Well, here, unfortunately, is the sad bit. Even knowing our past, we still tend to repeat it. <laughs> so we hope we don't as badly, but it does tend to get repeated a lot anyhow. When I'm talking about losing our memory, it's not so much of something that happened in history, but it is living through it. Oh, okay. But it's both. Yes, it's important to have it written down. But the cycle of the strong men, you know, fighting wars, the lessons mm -hmm. they learned, why you don't want to go to war. Yes. Because of how horrific it is. And then they have kids, they have an easy life because they don't have to go to war. And then yes. is that cycle. It's the cycle. It's funny. I actually posted a meme not that long ago about the fact that strong men make good times. Good times make weak men. Weak men make bad times. Bad times make strong men. Yeah. Like the rinse repeat kind of deal. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that definitely has to do with the people that lived through the tough times. They're not yeah. around to have the wisdom to tell everybody you shouldn't be doing this. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. A troop of Wiccans rode toward them, leading spear mounts, including Duerker's faithful mare. Beyond them, the lead wagons of the refugees emerged from the dust, and off to one side waited three additional wagons, guarded, Duerker could see, by Nil and Nether. Duerker drew a deep breath and said, About Corporal List. Captain Lull interrupted. He will not be swayed. He asked that I pass on his words of farewell, Duerker. I believe he muttered something about a ghost at his shoulder, whatever that means. Then he said, tell the historian that I have found my war. Coltane looked away as if those words had struck through to him where all other words could not. That's sad that Duerker didn't get to say goodbye to List to his face. Yeah. Because List, you know, he really grew up a lot on this journey. He spent a ton of time with Duerker. Yeah. Yeah, he did. In a weird way, I'm kind of glad we didn't say goodbye to List in a way because I would have gotten teary eyed over a prolonged farewell, I guarantee you. Yeah, saying bye to Moby was bad enough. Dude. Yeah. And what's funny, we see Moby less than we've seen List. True. He, and Moby is in two books. And so, yeah, List, yeah, that would have been a hard one to take. You know, I think in a weird way, List does kind of represent folks or come to me to represent folks that want to do something better. And you know, have and then through this hard crucible does become what he wants to be, which is an honorable soldier, a, a person not afraid, a very competent soldier, knowing even knowing what fate awaits him, he embraces it because he's found his home. That's well said. Thank you. <laughs> Coltane said, Captain, inform the companies we attack within the hour. Duerker thought, attack? Hood's breath. <laughs> He felt awkward in his own body, his hands like leaden lumps at his sides, as if the question of what to do with his own flesh and bone, what to do in the next moment, had driven him to a crisis. Lull's voice broke through. Your horse has arrived, historian. Durker released a shaky breath. Facing Lull, he slowly shook his head. He said, historian? No, perhaps I shall return to being a historian a week from now. But at this moment, and for what's to come, he shook his head a second time and went on. I have no word for what I should be called right now. He smiled and said, I think old man suffices. <laughs> Lull seemed rattled by Duerker's smile. The captain faced Colton and said, Fist, this man feels he has no title. He's chosen old man. Colton growled, a poor choice. Old men are wise, not fools. He scowled at Duerker and said, There is not one among your acquaintances who struggles with who and what you are. We know you as a soldier. Does that title insult you, sir? Duerker's eyes narrowed. He said, no, at least I don't think so. Coltane said, lead the refugees to safety, soldier. Mm. Duerker said, yes, Fist. The nameless Marine spoke. I have something for you, Duerker. Lull grunted. What? Here? <laughs> she handed Duerker a tatter of cloth. She said, wait a while before you read what's on it, please. Duerker could only nod as he tucked the scrap in his belt. He looked at the three figures before him, wishing Bolt and List had been present for this. But there would be no staged goodbyes, no comfort of roles to step into. Like everything else, the moment was messy, awkward, and incomplete. Lull said, get on that scrawny beast of yours and stay in Hood's blindside, friend. Mm. I like that saying. Yeah. <laughs> Duerker said, I wish the same for you, all of you. Coltane hissed wheeling to face north. 
He bared his teeth and said, Not a chance of that, Duerker. We intend to carve a bloody path right down the bastard's throat. Mm. This scene is particularly tough for me to get through. The nameless Marine handing him the note was very touching. Mm -hmm. And then Lull keeping it light with some humor. And then Coltane's ferocity were great as well. Oh, yes. I appreciated that to help offset that because yeah, I would have been more weepy had that not popped up there. And But yeah, I have a very hard time too as we approach the end of the chain here. And I get a little misty. when she, I got a little misty when she handed in that note. <laughs> yeah. Flanked by Nil and Nether, Duerker rode at the head of the refugee train, heading toward the tribe on the ridge. The Wiccan outriders and those guarding the selected wagons were all very young, boys and girls still with their first weapons. Their collective outrage at having been sent from their clans was a silent storm. Dorker thought, yet, if Coltane has erred in this gamble, they will wield those weapons one more time, one last time. Nil said, two riders. Dorker grunted, good sign, as his eyes focused on the pair that now approached at a canter. Both were elders, a man and a woman, lean and weathered, their skin the same hue as the buckskins that clothed them. Hook-bladed swords were slung under their left arms, and ornate iron helmets covered their heads. Their eyes were framed in robust cheek plates. Duerker said, Stay here, Nil. Nether, with me, please. He nudged his mare forward. They met just beyond the lead wagons, reining in to face each other with a few paces between them. Duerker was the first to speak. These are Karan Dobri lands, recognized by treaty. The Malazan Empire honors all such treaties. We seek passage. The woman, her eyes on the wagons, snapped in unaccented Malazan, How much? Duerker said, A collection from all the soldiers of the seventh, in imperial coin, a worth totaling 41,000 silver jacatas. The woman scowled and said, A full strength Malazan army's annual wages. This was no collection. Do your soldiers know you have stolen their wages to buy passage? Duerker blinked, then said softly, The soldiers insisted, Elder. This was in truth a collection. Wow. What dedication from them. I know it. This is the point that I was coming back to about how seriously they're taking their role in defending yes. the refugees yeah. to the point where they're paying for the refugees to pass the tribal lands with their own money. Yeah. Dude, that's quite moving. I mean, that gets me choked up. <laughs> I mean, these guys were so dedicated to get like i said they're so dedicated to getting these folks there it's like we know we're gonna die but you know what we're gonna pay for your passage ahead of what we doing <laughs> yeah kind of deal it's like wow we did nether then spoke from the three wiccan clans an additional payment jewelry cookware skins bolts of felt horseshoes tack and leather and an assortment of coins looted in the course of our long journey from hisar in an amount approaching seventy three thousand silver jacatas mm -hmm. all given freely the woman was silent for a long moment. Then her companion said something to her in their own tongue. She shook her head in reply, her flat, dun eyes finding Duerker again. She said, And with this offer, you seek passage for these refugees and for the Wiccan clans and for the seventh? Duerker said, No, elder, for the refugees alone and this small guard you see here. She said, We reject your offer. Duerker thought, Lull was right to dread this moment. Damn it. The woman said, it is too much. The treaty with the Empress is specific. At a loss, Duerker could only shrug. He said, then a portion thereof. The woman interrupted, with the remainder entering Aaron, where it shall be hoarded uselessly until such time as Corbolo Dom breaches the gates, and so you end up paying him for the privilege of slaughtering you. Nether said, then with that remainder, we would hire you as escort. Duerker's heart stuttered. The woman said, to the city's gates, too far. We shall escort you to Balan village and the beginning of the road known as Aaron Way. This, however, leaves a portion remaining. We shall sell you food and what healing may prove necessary and within the abilities of our horsewives. Nether's brows rose. She asked, horsewives? The elder nodded. Nether smiled and said, the Wiccans are pleased to know the Karan Dobri. The woman said, come forward then with your people. And what an interesting people these are. I appreciated the logic behind their negotiation. It was very honorable of them to provide the services in exchange for the coin and nothing more, nothing less. Yeah. They could very well have fleeced them for all the coin. They could have. And also, this is another thing I kind of find touching that they're, that I think this is because they're, uh, 
obviously they're horse wives, another horse culture here. And I guess a lot of these plains people would be, and that they respect the Wiccans and they've come to like them. And, and I think they feel like, wow, we can, you know, they're, they're turning kind of on the people they're supposed to be helping mm-hmm. <laughs> to help these people because they've, the, the Wiccans have gained these people's respect along the way, or they've got there or when, or when they get to these people's lands and Corbolo's probably counting on them to help them. These people are like, well, we're just here to check it out. And then they see it and they're like, well, we agree with the Wiccans. <laughs> Do you think it's them agreeing with the Wiccans or is it, they just want to uphold their end of the treaty with the Malazan empire? No, that's, that's a, good question there I, i'm not sure on that aspect it's, it's it could be both you're probably pretty i, I don't know because this culture is seen i i, I can't tell you I, I can't even begin to say comrade i don't have an idea yeah it's weird because by all accounts they think that aaron's going to be taken over by the army of the apocalypse she says as much they don't want the money going in there so that corbolo dom can get a hold of it yes knowing that they also must think that they're going to find out that we help them for a certain portion of this journey. So there's going to be some type of punitive action repercussions, right yeah. from them doing this. So I think it goes to show their honor as a people. Yes. They want to uphold their part of the bargain. Yeah, I think you're right. It has, Well, yeah, it has to do with their honor. I think that they, it's a recognized the, how honorable the Wiccans have been in this maybe. And that's a, a kinship that they're willing to be like, you know what? Hey, we're game. <laughs> <laughs> the two rode back to their kin. Duker watched them for a moment. Then he wheeled his horse and stood in his stirrups. Far to the north over Sanamon hung a dust cloud. He asked, Nether, can you send Coltane a message? Nether said, I can offer him a knowing. Yes. Duker said, do so. Tell him he was right. So you think Coltane suspected they were of a similar mindset? to that of the Wiccans? I would have to assume so. Coltan uh, is extremely well informed. And I'm going to ask you a question because it just now, it just got formed right here is, do you think some of these other groups may have been present or had people present to see the Kundral pledge to the Wiccans? Mm. And so that, that made them more amenable to like, you know, they're similar cultures. They're, you know, they may be enemies, but they're at least like-minded in certain aspects. And that's like, okay, you know what? We see this and we respect this, but maybe that has something to do with it too. I don't know. It's hard to say because they're pretty close to where this battle took place. It's, say it's two days. Right? You yeah. know, They said 40 hours straight of battle, yes. assuming it took Duiker and Nil and Nether some time to get to where they are after that when they left the chain of dogs behind mm-hmm. They may have heard, I don't know if they had scouts out there and they rode back or something. It's possible. Yeah. I th- yeah. I just, I just, we've, we have always found Coltane to be pretty well informed of the situation. Is all I, uh, so I, that's all I can say. He's well informed. <laughs> yeah. How he does it, I don't know. That's why he's such a great commander. The sense rose slowly, as if from a body all had believed cold, a corpse in truth, the realization rising, filling the air, the spaces in between. Faces took on a cast of disbelief, a numbness that was reluctant to yield its protective barriers. Dusk arrived, clothing an encampment of 30,000 refugees in the joining of two silences. One from the land and the night sky, with its crushed glass stars, the other from the people themselves. Dour-faced Karanal moved among them, their gifts and gestures belying their expressions and reserve. And to each place they went, it was as if they brought in their touch a release. Sitting beneath that glittering night sky, surrounded by thick grasses, Duker listened to the cries that cut through the darkness, wrenching at his heart. Joy wrought with dark, blistering anguish, wordless screams, uncontrolled wailing. A stranger would have believed that some horror stalked the camp. A stranger would not have understood the release that Duker heard, the sounds that his own soul answered with burning pain, making him blink at the stars that blurred and swam overhead. The release born of salvation was nevertheless tortured, and Duerker well knew why, well knew what was reaching down from the north, a host of inescapable truths. Somewhere out there in the darkness stood a wall of human flesh, clothed in shattered armor, which still defied Corbolo Dom, which had purchased and was still purchasing this dread salvation. There was no escape from that knowledge. Grasses whispered near him, and he sensed a familiar presence crouched down beside him. Duker asked, how fares Coltane? Nether sighed, the linkage is broken. 
Duerker stiffened. After a long moment, he released a shaky breath. He asked, Gone, then? Nether said, We do not know. Dill continues with the effort, but I fear in our weariness our blood ties are insufficient. We sensed no death cry, and we most surely would, Duerker. Duerker said, Perhaps he's been captured. Nether said, perhaps, historian, if Corbel Odom arrives on the morrow, these Quran will pay dearly for this contract, nor may they prove sufficient in, in, Duerker said, Nether? She hung her head and said, I am sorry, I cannot stop my ears. They may be deluding themselves. Even if we make it to Balan, to Aaron Way, it is still three leagues to the city itself. Duerker said, I share your misgivings. But out there, well, it's the gestures of kindness, don't you see? We, none of us, have any defense against them. Nether exclaimed, The release is too soon, Duerker. Duerker said, Possibly, but there's not a damn thing we can do about it. They turned at the sound of voices. A group of figures approached from the encampment. A hissing argument was underway, quickly quelled as the group neared. Duerker slowly rose, Nether doing the same beside him. Nethpara called out, I trust we are not interrupting anything untoward. Duerger said, I would suggest that the council retire for the night. A long day of marching awaits us all tomorrow. Pulikalar hastily said, and that is precisely why we are here. Nethpara said, those of us retaining a measure of wealth have succeeded in purchasing from the Quran fresh horses for our carriages. Pulikalar added, we wish to leave now, our small group that is, and make with all haste for Aaron. Nithpara cut in, where we shall insist the Hyphus dispatch a force to provide guard for the rest of you. Man, they must think Duerker is so dumb. Oh, as I'm assuming most aristocrats think this because everyone is below them. It's crazy. Oh, my word. I mean, they've learned nothing. They've learned nothing from, what, eight months, <laughs> ten months on the run with these people? <laughs> Duerker stared at the two men, then at the dozen figures behind them. He asked, where is Tumlet? Nethpara said, Alas, he fell ill three days ago and is no longer among the living. We all deeply mourn his passing. Duerger thought, No doubt. He said, Your suggestion has merit, but is rejected. Nethpara said, But, Duerger interrupted, Nethpara, if you start moving now, you'll incite panic, and that is something none of us can afford. No, you travel with the rest of us and must be content with being the first of the refugees to pass beneath the city gates at the head of the train. Nithpara shouted, This is an outrage! <laughs> Duerker said, Get out of my sight, Nithpara, before I finish what I began at Vathar Crossing. Nithpara shouted, Oh, do not for a moment believe I have forgotten, historian! Duerker said, An additional reason for rejecting your request. Return to your carriages. Get some sleep. We'll be pushing hard tomorrow. This is exactly why Duerker shouldn't let him get there first. Mm, absolutely. Pulik hissed, A certainty! Corbolodom is hardly finished with us. Now that Coltane's dead and his army with him, we are to trust our lives to these stinking nomads. And when the <laughs> escort ends, three leagues from Aaron, you send us all to our deaths. Quote, unquote, stinking nomads. See how oh. they view the natives of this land? Wow. Bunch of dirty, stinking savages. Get your darn dirty ape hands off of me. I'm, I'm so sorry. Wrong story. Sorry. But yes, I, I do see. Yeah, they just, yeah, it's just, if it ain't done their way, like I can say, I, I just so shocked. I, I shouldn't be shocked, but it's like, have these people not encountered any combat losses at all while they've been in their coaches? The way they're talking, what I was thinking is they must be nobles from Unta. Oh, oh, oh. Because they're talking about the natives here like there's some other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they are true. That's true. Well, think about this because you're right. Because most of the nobles, this is how the nobles get. Well, you know, they can also go to other places and, and spread their money around to be more powerful in other places, maybe than, in, than inside the regular boundaries of the Malazan Empire. But yeah, I think you're probably right. I didn't even think about that. Either way, they think they're better. Yes, they do. Dorker growled, I, all or none. Now I'm done speaking. Leave. Pulik said, oh, are you now that Wiccan dog reborn? He reached for the rapier at his belt. He said, I hereby challenge you to a duel. Durker's sword was a blur, the flat of the blade cracking Pulik Alar's temple. The nobleborn dropped to the ground unconscious. Durker whispered, Coltine reborn? No, mm. just a soldier. Uh, uh, uh. That's a good quote again. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. That's real. Um, 
I don't know who I'd want to say that. Is that Kurt Russell or is it, you know, is it, you know, who, who would be the person? No, just a soldier. Just one of those great one-liners, you know. Maybe Sam Elliott. Oh. <laughs> uh, dude, Sam Elliott's the perfect call. <laughs> yes, make it so. <laughs> and those were some impressive moves from Duiker there. Yeah. Pula Galar is a duelist. You would think that he would have faster reflexes. Now, it, one thing I'm curious about, a duelist, and I may be wrong on this, but my perception could be that a duelist is not always necessarily a fighter. You know, it, under the right circumstances, they're fast and good, but against just regular stuff, if you, you know, let's say you rush somebody and grab them by the arm and start beating their face in with a rock, you know, and these guys are expecting a sword fight with them, you know, they're not going to do well. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point. It's similar to someone specializing in a single martial art yeah. going against somebody that is just scrappy. They are yeah. a mixed martial arts user or dirty fighter. Just dirty fighter. Street fighter, right? The Krav Maga. <laughs> One person only has the experience of operating within a specific rule set. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. So and there's also the thing that they, it's, it's kind of like Wyatt Earp. Kind of just cracked him in the face and shut him up before it can get out of control. It's like, you know. Okay. I, there's, there's a new sheriff in town. You know, it's like. Yeah. Speaking of <laughs> Kurt Russell, I'm oh. thinking of that scene with Billy Bob Thornton where he's oh, slapping him in the skin face. Skin that smoke wagon. <laughs> Are you going to skin that smoke wagon? That's one of my favorite lines of all time, dude. <laughs> oh, oh, that's amazing. Yeah. That is good. absolutely amazing. <laughs> Nether spoke, her eyes on the prone body. Your counsel will have to pay dearly to have that healed, Nethpara. Durker muttered, I suppose I could have swung harder and saved you the coin. Get out of my sight, all of you. The council retreated, carrying their fallen spokesman with them. Durker said, Nether, have the Wiccans watch them. Nether said, I, sir. All right, we're going to stop there and we will finish out the chapter next week. Mm. Mm. Wow. For standout moments... Duiker holding his own on the battlefield, really impressive for someone of his age. Oh, man, truly. You know, I think, especially like we talked about, because he's been so, you know, he's always played like he's full of fear. He doesn't know what he's doing. And everyone comments, all the other people around him, you know, all the other soldiers are like always impressed with his moves. And it's kind of like, you know, I think that it took us to getting to this point to realize he's actually a heck of a soldier. Mm hmm. He's an elite. He's admitting he's a soldier now. Yes. Yes. That part, oh, that gets me. The fact that any soldiers were left standing after that 40-hour engagement is incredible. And the fact that out of 30 hours that they lost no refugees, how inspiring. Really impressive. Dude. Yeah, amazing. The goodbye scene with Lull, Coltane, and the Nameless Marine. That yeah. was very emotional for me. Don't say much more. You'll get me all choked up here, yeah. so. Move along. I did my tearing up earlier while I was doing the notes. I was able to keep it together in the reading. Yeah. <laughs> the Malazan soldiers donating their pay to secure a passage for the refugees across oh, the tribal lands. What a dude. it's not really a sacrifice, but it's just very noble of them. But it is because they're they're paying past the sacrifice they're intending to make. Mm. Quick question for you. How did your mom react to this stuff? he threw here was she as emotionally moved as you were do you know we haven't talked this in depth about very specific details of it okay. because when you get in a conversation with somebody and it's not targeted toward one chapter yeah it's so easy to just talk about the mega big stuff that happens yeah. all the big battles or this was cool that was cool but to answer your question no we haven't sp spoken about this area in particular okay. uh, but i mean i think most people that read this you have a heart and you yeah. can feel something going through here i hope so i would hope so Duerker cracking pulik alar on the head with his sword before he could react Ooh. really like that he should have just killed that old boy <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't have helped it wouldn't have mattered i don't think but it would have been satisfying to me <laughs> <laughs> We're better than that, Billy. We are. I'm sorry. I'm really not a sadist or anything like that. It's just I have tired of the Aristos during this journey. They have made me oh. sick. I'm sick and tired of them. And they should have died months back on the journey, but they did not, thanks to the sacrifice of these people, and they're still biting the hands that feed them. 
you know, Mr. Erickson knows how to get me all riled up. And the way he writes nobles oh, in these oh gets me word. riled up. Yes, he does. <laughs> He's great, dude. Again, Mr. Erickson just is amazing. Yeah. He's the only author that I have read and that I can think of that has made me weep multiple times. I mean, other stuff, I've gotten misty eyed and choked up on some other people I love and adore reading and read of almost everything. King, King is one that gets me emotionally sometimes. I know it sounds funny, but you know what I'm talking about. King is a good writer. He can get you sometimes with some stuff, but not like this. There's something more human. And, and with, it, he writes people that, that are good characters with good intentions and good noble traits that, that do things like this. Soldiers that have sacrificed and laid everything on the line and then have paying past where they're going to be dead. It's like, you know, we still can't bear the idea of these people not getting there. Here, take our money, please, and get them there. Mm -hmm. You know, and I mean, dude. I've never, no other writer would do that, please. I've had other writers make me laugh yes. as well, but it's hard for me to think of one that's gotten me as emotional. Yeah. yeah. Right now, I can't think of one off the top of my head. Yeah. Like I said, King has got me laughing. Oh, my good gracious. That man has made me laugh. I mean, I've had to put a book down and like take a minute or five because I just can't stop laughing. Mm -hmm. And it's totally inappropriate at the wrong time. And that's what makes it so wonderful. You know, he just has that way, especially Eddie. I mean, good gracious. Hmm. How much stuff did you laugh at Eddie? But dude, he did make me cry in the Dark Tower, though. Yeah. Dude, so King has made me cry. But yeah, you know, I can't think of other people that have touched me so emotionally. I mean, I, I like I'm like you, I've laughed, I've hollered and been upset, but never just he writes such real people. Good gracious. The way that we like it's like it's like we like them. Yeah. It's the love of the characters. Yes. The relationships they have with each other. Yeah, I yes. think that's ultimately what it boils down to. Yeah, you're right. You're, you're right. It's it's how he writes them, but it's how he writes the relationships around them that's that's not captured by other people as well, I don't think. Agreed. All right, Billy, great job tonight. Hey, good job, man. Great episode. You got any final thoughts before we drop off here? Dude, what a ride. This is such an emotional episode uh, for both of us, even though we played it pretty cold. We did a good job of keeping it together. Keep it together. Keep it together. Uh, K-I-T. <laughs> Yep. T I T. Yeah. <laughs> a great episode, man. Great episode. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. See y'all next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us. And we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.